Welcome to this edition of Fortify. Today we are going to be learning about legal issues that are impacting nonprofit organizations as a result of COVID-19. My name is Janine Mason and I'm the founder and executive director of the Fieldstone Leadership Network San Diego. And I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of our partner in this program, the Nonprofit Institute at the University of San Diego. The Nonprofit Institute and Fieldstone are both organizations that are dedicated to supporting the leadership of our nonprofit sector. And COVID-19 provided a wonderful opportunity for us to come together to create this series of webinars to support nonprofit leaders as you're navigating and leading your organizations and your teams through COVID-19. The purpose of Fortify is to strengthen the leadership, the well-being, and the sustainability of nonprofit leaders and organizations with a true understanding that if we don't support our nonprofit leaders, we will not recover as well if we don't have you healthy and ready um, to lead through our recovery. So with that, we have crafted a 10-part webinar series called Fortify. To help you to make the most of your Fortify experience, I want to let you know that if you're having any technical difficulties whatsoever, you can contact Cynthia at the email that's listed on the screen, or you can contact Cynthia using the chat feature in Zoom, whichever is easiest for you. On this webinar, everyone is muted. So if you have questions as we go along um, the webinar today, please put those in the Q&A box. You'll find that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you have resources to share with the community, please put those in chat and we will um, gather all of those together and share them um, once we finish this webinar today. We will stay on for about 10 minutes after the webinar has concluded today for our after hours time. And this is a extended time for questions so that we can make sure that we have all of the questions answered that you have. We are recording this webinar and it will be available both on the Fieldstone Leadership Network webpage and the webpage for the Nonprofit Institute at USC. And we will also include the resources that we refer to on the web webinar on the website as well. As I mentioned, we will have our speakers with us for an additional 10 minutes after uh, one o'clock today so that we can make sure we get all of your questions answered. And with that, I'd like to turn um, the program over to Dr. Laura Dietrich. Laura is the Associate Director of the Nonprofit Institute at the University of San Diego. Laura? Is Laura here? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay, good. All right. Welcome. All right. If you could, it's a very intriguing webinar when nobody talks. If you can forward to the next slide, um, I'll be quick. I just wanted to uh, welcome everybody today and tell you that Fortify um, is a series that actually grows out of our research, research that many of you have taken the time to participate in, where we learned that you needed help um, with specific things. So we've designed this webinar to address the top needs, the support needs that nonprofit leaders have told us in our last two surveys that they, that they need help with. And some of that is capacity and organizational. Um, we've had many people write in and ask questions about legal issues. We are not lawyers and we don't pretend to be. So we are so fortunate to have our colleagues here from, um, from San Diego Volunteer Lawyers Association. Uh, I saw them post on our Facebook resource exchange and said, we need them for our webinar series. So without further ado, I'm just gonna turn it over um, to Arlene and to Juan and they will lead you through um, getting all of your questions answered, I'm sure. Actually, I think Roy is gonna make some introductions. Go right ahead. Perfect, thanks. Um, if we could just switch over to the other uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, thank you for that introduction. I'm Roya Bagheri. I'm a staff attorney at San Diego Volunteer Lawyer Program, and we're really happy to be partnering with USD's Nonprofit Institute and the Fieldstone Leadership Network San Diego. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so just a little bit about SDVLP. We're a 501c3 nonprofit law firm that has provided free legal help to disadvantaged San Diegans since 1983. And we have a micro business and nonprofit support program 
that provides free legal services to qualifying entrepreneurs and micro businesses in San Diego, as well as to nonprofit organizations whose primary purpose is to serve disadvantaged low income San Diegans. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of nonprofit support, we provide assistance with nonprofit formation, uh, governance, employment issues, real estate, land use, uh, review and drafting of contracts, intellectual property, insurance. Next slide, please. Um, and so uh, if, if you're looking for services through our program, our application is available on our website. Um, and if your organization is deemed eligible for our services, we will discuss an issue spot, the potential legal issues, and then reach out to pro bono attorneys to place your case with subject matter experts, such as our experts, Arlene and Juan, who are um, going to be giving you this presentation. And then you'll be able to work one-on-one -on -one with your assigned pro bono attorney, and SDVLP will remain involved throughout the process until the case is fully completed. Next slide, please. Um, and then we are also actually, we've launched a COVID-19 nonprofit brief legal advice clinic um, to assist businesses and nonprofit organizations that have been impacted by the pandemic. So volunteer attorneys have been providing remote consultations to eligible organizations on legal issues, including labor and employment, real estate, insurance, contracts, tax law, uh, the PPP, SBA's idle uh, business operations, which would include operating as essential business, as well as business reopening procedures, bankruptcy restructuring, as well as other COVID related questions. Next slide, please. Um, so the consultations will last up to 45 minutes and are provided free of charge um, and nonprofits can apply uh, at the website here on the slide. Um, it's an all, it's all online fillable application um, or that's the number to, to contact if you have questions. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of this presentation, um, providing the presentation on employment law is Arlene Yang, a partner at Brown Law Group and then providing the section on PPP real estate and restructuring uh, is Juan Zuniga, a partner at Ramon Law. And um, we've already emailed, I believe, out the, their bios uh, for both of them. So I'll uh, kind of just launch right into it, but if you could go to the next slide and the next slide and the next slide, and I'm gonna turn it over to Arlene. So thank you both so much for, for being here. Great. Thank you, Roy. And thank you for having me here today to talk about employment law issues. As Roy mentioned, I'm a partner. My name is Arlene Yang. I'm a partner at Brown Law Group, and I focus on employment law and business litigation. So I'm also, I have a lot of experience with nonprofit organizations. I'm currently the board chair of Transcendence Youth Arts Project, which is based in San Diego County. And I, I recognize that this is a time when funding sources are drying up, but the need for the organization is more important than ever. And, and so I'm here to help you to try to identify some of the issues that as an employer, you're gonna to want to navigate around so that you don't have some problems in the future, which can get very expensive. So since we have, I have only about 20 minutes to talk to you about employment law issues. So it's gonna be more an exercise of issue spotting rather than going into great detail in any particular issue. Um, this is my first time trying. We have a poll. So I'd like to see if we could do the first poll, which is asking the size of your organization. And so I'll give you a couple. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, so we're getting a, we're getting a picture of how many employees are in the organization. Okay, so it looks like about 80% of the employees, 80% um, of you have 25 or fewer employees. And then maybe we can look at the next poll just to see how many, um, I wanted to find out what you consider your biggest employment concerns. So if you have concerns that aren't mentioned here, we can, um, feel free to put in the Q&A and we can, just to get an idea of what you're facing. So, okay, so this, that's pretty interesting. It looks like 
many of you are um, concerned about returning to work, which is what's, what's been in the news. So I'll make sure that we can spend more time on that. Thanks so much. So going to, well, let's move on to the next slide. We're gonna go forward a few slides. We can close the poll, I'm not sure how, or I, I wanted to just point out to you, I'm a lawyer. So just to let you know, this is not legal advice for your particular situation. We're not forming an attorney client relation. And um, just to note that, especially if someone's watching this at a later time, things are changing quickly from week, day to day, week to week. So you, if you're gonna make decisions, I would advise you to like look and make sure that the things I'm telling you are up to date. And Next slide. Oh yes, if you have questions, please put it in the Q&A box. So the, the main thing is the basic strategies that you're gonna to wanna to implement to mitigate the organization. If we go to the next slide, the biggest issue that we're going to think about is wage and hour issues. And this is just, this was the, something was troublesome for employers before the pandemic. And it's going to be after, especially now there be so many people who are unemployed and having problems. There's going to be. So base you're going to want to keep in mind, making sure that you're keeping system, making sure you have, if you have non-exempt employees that they're getting meal periods and rest breaks, you have documentation of the wage and hour issues. Um, something that employers may not have uh, realized when everyone rushed to work from home is that you still have to be making sure that employees get the meal periods and rest breaks, even if they're working from home. So you're gonna need to make sure that you're keeping your timekeeping system. Another issue that I found, especially some smaller employers have not realized is the expense reimbursement requirement. So you may know that if you're requiring your employee to drive their car for work, you're gonna to need to have some reimbursement. But also if you're requiring them to use their cell phone, you're requiring them to use their computer to do their work, they're gonna need, to, you're gonna be needing to reimburse some of their expenses related to those things. It doesn't have to be 100%, but some percentage or some set amount should be set aside to reimburse their employees. Um, also, as I know many people considering or have already, laid off employees because of the pandemic. You need to make sure that if you're going an employee on the very day, the very last day of their employment, they need to be paid their wages due and as well as any accrued vacation time or PTO. So you can't wait until the next payroll period. You can't mail check um, on the last day of employment and then have the check arrive to them a few days later that that check late, they're owed one day of pay up to 30 days. So just that little chunk there, if they're not paid for 30 days, you could owe them 30 days pay and they labor commission and, and try to collect that money. So just, just keep in mind these small, these things that seem like minor violations can get very expensive quickly. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, the, then, Another issue you're going to want to about, just I'm not going to go into the great detail, is just paying attention to reasonable accommodations, especially now as people are considering a return to work. There may be people who don't want to come to work because of their medical condition. So you're going to want to make sure that this, your, the magic words are the interactive process. You're going to need to make sure that you're having communications with employees to understand what the problem is and see if you can accommodate. And it, there's no law saying that you have to accommodate, but you have to really document and engage in a process where you're trying to accommodate the employee. Romaine. And then the next, yes. Can I just interrupt you with one question that we have about wages since you've, you've talked about yeah. that so far. And the question is, is it legal to pay employees more during the 60 days covered by potential PPP loan forgiveness to increase payroll expenses? and then reduce the salary later in the year to compensate back to that employee's actual annual earnings? You know, I think that might actually be a better question for Juan. Yeah, do you want me to address the question now or when I have the discussion about PPP? I think maybe we should wait until we get to that point in your presentation. How does that sound? 
Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So go ahead, Arlene. So, All right. So we'll go back question. And the other question is, how do we calculate the reimbursement for cell and computer use? Is a fixed amount for all staff acceptable? Yes, you can do a fixed amount. And I've seen different companies and organizations do it at different rates. So it could be, you know, you just have to, you have to set an amount, you have to pay it. And then you also should have a policy and explain to employees if they feel like they need to be reimbursed some higher amount, that they should talk to the employer so that you can adjust it. Because the goal is to try to cover the amount. And of course, everyone's using their cell phone and their internet for other purposes now too, their personal purposes. So it's, you're not expected to pay for the whole thing. Um, okay, so then, then okay, on to the next slide. And just a basic thing that most employers should have would be an employee handbook, which lays out the rules for the employee. California is one of the most employee friendly states in the country. And so there are just a lot of rules and it's helpful to have those policies written down and then the employee acknowledges them. So for example, to avoid claims for someone saying down the road that they didn't get their meal periods and rest breaks. If you have that policy in your handbook and then the employees acknowledged it, then you then they have a harder time saying, well, I d you never told me that I could take a meal period of rest break because it's in writing. And then there's something showing that they uh, recognize that this is the policy. And things now like sexual harassment policies, it's required to be given to employee and you should have written acknowledgement that they received it. So having it all in, wrapped up in one handbook can, can save some headaches down the, down the road if you ever run into any litigation. And it's also just helpful for employees to understand um, what their rights are. Um, also, we're encouraging people to have arbitration agreements to avoid litigation. Okay, so then we go on to the next slide. When, so another issue that's been concerning um, employees generally, right, the biggest expenses for an organization is often first payroll costs and then real estate. So Juan's going to be talking about real estate. I'm going to talk a little bit about we're going to, what, ha what happens when you're reducing your costs by having layoffs. So if we go on to the next slide, I just wanted to point out some things that you'd like to, that you should know. A lot of people talk about furloughs as some, a temporary way to stop paying the employees. But just know that in California, really the process the, the term furlough is used to talk about government employees. So if it's so if you've been if you're furloughing an employee for two weeks, the state of California will consider that they're laid off. So any wages that would be due to them would be owed on that as you know at the time that they were laid off. So you you just really want to not not use the term furlough, unfortunately, and and just lay off the employees if you're not going to be able to pay them for a while. Um, thinking about when you're returning to work, you want to think about um, when you're bringing back employees now, fortunately, we're able to start bringing back some employees that we had to lay off. You may want to treat them as a new employee and there are new I-9 forms and new W-4 forms that have come, come up within the last year or so. So you're going to want to make sure that your employees have signed the most recent forms. And, um, and if their immigration status has changed or something, you're going to want to make sure that you know about that. For larger employers, you need to be concerned about the Warren Act and the California Warren Act. And that's way too technical for me to get into the details today. But just know that these are statutes which generally require employers to notify their employees in advance of a mass layoff. Um, the pandemic has changed the requirements a little bit, but still there has to be documentation that's sent to the employee. So you just want to make sure you're avoiding those kind of problems. And just know that when you're considering a reduction in force, you really need to have a business justification for why you're letting employees go. So for example, if you have a situation where you have an older employee or someone with underlying health conditions, you can't decide, well, they're going to be able to collect unemployment. I'm going to lay off this person um, because they wouldn't be able to come back to work anyway. 
that kind of thing, then, you, then you're opening yourself up to a claim for disability discrimination or age discrimination. So you wanna make sure that you're gonna have a business justification that's not based on some sort of protected classes or something, or you know, whistleblowers or any kind of thing like that when you have to make layoffs. Then if we can go to the next slide. Um, I just also wanted to point out that there are new federal leave laws. If we can go on to the next slide. I know that the, there's been a lot of attention to the PPP and so many nonprofits were trying to get that money and less attention has been paid to these new sick leave requirements. Before this time, this is the first time that there's been a federal sick leave requirement. And there's two types. One is emergency paid sick leave and then the other one is an an expansion of FEMLA, but both of them are for paid sick leave. So you just want to know the the first one could be up to two weeks for um, an employee who is suffering from COVID symptoms. That's the bulk of who's covered. And then the other one is related to someone who is caring for a child who cannot attend school because of the pandemic. Initially, when this law came out, there was a lot of thinking that small employers under 50 employees would be exempted from this. But it's become clear that their exemption may apply to the emergency family leave, but it does not apply to emergency paid sick leave. So you're gonna to need to want to understand what the requirements are. Um, this can be quite burdensome for small employers because the small employer has to pay for the sick leave themselves. There's, they're pretty much getting a credit from their payroll taxes, so that should reduce the tax burden. But still, it can be, it, we're expecting it could be quite burdensome for employers. And the other thing that you're going to want to pay attention to is that there's a requirement to post the um, information about these new laws. So if we go to the next slide, you can see the, um, this is what it looks like, and that's the website. You just have to look it up on the Department of Labor and you can get that. If, if you, all of you are working from home, then you can email it to your employees if you can't post it somewhere. Arlene, mm -hmm. if, an, if employees are treated as new employees, do they lose vacation time? Well, so vacation time is not required under, um, let's see. So if, you, if it's accrued vacation time, when you let the employee go, then at that time you have to pay them out their vacation time. If it's, um, if it's something like when you're talking about whether, um, you know, sometimes as you have more seniority, you can, you can get more vacation time um, as the years pass. You, that's really up to you to decide whether you want to, you know, bring them back at that same accrual rate as they had before. But if they had, yeah, if they had any accrued vacation, when you let them go, you have to pay them the vacation time. You don't have to pay sick leave um, unless you had some policy saying that you do. But vacation time is something that's considered owned by the employee. All right, so then we're going on to the next slide. And okay, so then this is a big issue. Where do we stand with contract and gig workers? So back in December and January, the big issue was AB5 among nonprofits that I was talking to. And because so many industries were focused, just wrapped around having independent contractors instead of employees. And so this AB5 was a new law passed that was enacted and went into effect January 1st. And it made it much more difficult for employers to consider their workers to be independent contractors rather than employees. And there are some exceptions, exemptions, and you need to kind of navigate to see if you can meet those exemptions. Um, so just be aware that this is still an issue. Um, what's gonna happen, you often, especially with nonprofit employers, everyone's pretty happy working and there aren't any problems, but then sometimes something happens and then this issue comes to light. So I'll give you some examples. I was. I was helping this dance company and they were hiring all of their dancers as independent contractors. Then one of the dancers got injured while he was dancing. So he files a workers' comp claim, but he wasn't an employee. So then that raises the issue. Okay, then the, then the state agency starts digging and they're saying, well, you misclassified this employee. You were supposed to treat them as a 
employee and not independent contractor. So we see this, this kind of issue come up, for instance, if someone is um, kind of not working for your organization anymore as an independent contractor, if they file for unemployment, that might raise an issue. Or if someone says, I should have been treated as an employee, and then they file a claim with a labor commissioner for their overtime or missed meal periods and rest breaks, then the employer is kind of left defenseless. The, the state agencies treat the employer as having to follow all the rules. So if there's any documentation required, misclassification, it's really the fault of the employer. Even if the employee prefers to be treated as an independent contractor, if they are not supposed to be classified as one, it's the blame goes to the employer. So this is just something you, you really need to take a look at make sure that you have your workers classified the right way. And then the next issue is the CARES Act. I won't, I won't go into too, too much details about this, but um, we have the new CARES Act, which as everyone's heard by now, expanded the unemployment benefits available for employees. Um, related to independent contractors, just be aware that for the first time, there are also benefits available to independent contractors and the self-employed. So as we see, this um, additional $600 is only going through July. And so we're expecting that once those benefits end and people, if people are still unemployed, we may see an increase in claims against their employers because they're looking for additional income. Um, so just be aware that, that that's out there. Um, next, we have Let's see, our next topic is, okay, so now this was an issue that is, was of concern to so many of you today. What are we gonna think about as we plan for a return to the workplace? Um, and this could be a whole nother hour of presentation, but I'll just kind of highlight for you some of the issues you need to think about. So one thing that you should be aware of is that the County of San Diego has, if we can go to the next slide too, or actually, if we can go for two slides, I can just show you the links to the County of San Diego, which has some, um, they've posted um, an order. I'm hoping you can hear me. They've posted an order, county health order and then some forms that need to be completed in order to reopen the business needs to be posted. And there are also some templates for different industries. So you wanna take a look at that um, so that you understand what the county is requiring for businesses to return to work. I'd also like to point out the Re San Diego Regional Economic Development Corporation has some really great resources, both on reopening issues and also resources for small businesses and nonprofits um, in terms of dealing with the crisis. And now if we can go back to the Previous slide. Oh, if we can go back, um, go back to the one before this one. Yeah, um, right. So, just other things that you're going to need to keep in mind are the are OSHA, the CDC, and see as they start having more guidance about what to do. We're going to, if we can go for just one more slide, you're going to want to think about personal protective equipment. That's generally going to be masks and we're advising employers that they should be providing masks to their employees. We're, I think it's likely to be considered something like the reimbursement for a cell phone use, that it's something that you're gonna, it's something that you need to provide to the employees. Um, right, so then we're gonna think about physical distancing, health screening. Um, health screening has been a controversial issue in the past. Um, in the past, the EEOC did, said that you could not um, you could not take employees temperature but now because of the pandemic it's permitted and it seems as though the county may even be suggesting it i think that there are a lot of concerns with taking employees temperature in terms of um, whether it's effective whether you're protecting their health information appropriately and um, those type of information that, that type of thing. So you, you're gonna wanna think carefully when you're health screening items. And 
there's also concern if you, if you have, for example, employees standing on a long line waiting to get their temperature taken, that time is compensable. You're going to need to be paying them for that time as well. So just keep that in mind. Um, I wanted to also mention you need to think about workers' compensation. So everyone should have workers' compensation insurance. Just recently, Governor Newsom issued an executive order which said that if someone is working outside of the home and they get sick within four, with COVID within 14 days of working at the employer, then it's going to be presumed that they got it at work. And so it's going to be covered under workers' comp um, unless within 30 days there's a challenge to it. So that means initially it's not going to affect employers too much because that, that's why they have insurance so that they don't have to pay out of pocket for each claim. But we think that eventually, if there are a lot of claims that are made, it's going to raise the insurance rates. And so this is going to be make things more difficult for employers in the future. Um, I also wanted to just point out that as you're bringing the employees into the workplace, you want to make sure that you're avoiding discrimination. I had a friend who was telling me she was thinking about bringing back the employees, but she was thinking of telling the ones with underlying health conditions that they should stay home and everyone else could come back. So while she might have thought that she was doing a favor to the employee to make them stay home, actually, that could be seen as discrimination because she wasn't letting that person make their own choice and, she was, and they might feel like they were disadvantaged in some way by having to continue to work from home while everyone else went back to the office. So all the regular discrimination laws are still going to apply and you need to just really think what they're doing and how it's impacting the employees. And so then you're going to also want to think about planning for a rapid return to work from home. So as we've seen some places that are farther along, like in Asia, they were able to get everything under control. They started opening things up again. But then when there's another outbreak, they have to shut it down again. So you just want to make sure that if you bring your employees back to the workplace, that they are um, that you're able to shut it down again quickly if you need to. Um, so that's basically kind of an overview of some of the issues I think we can talk about. I'm happy to ask questions for now or at the end. So um, Arlene, I think there was just one question about OSHA. Um, for an organization that's 99% volunteer, can they ask volunteers to take, question, uh, to take their temperatures? So I would, I, you know, I, I haven't looked exactly at that, but I, I believe that it may be possible, right, if you are, because you don't want them to infect other people. Um, and I think in some, in some cases, isn't it possible, like, that, that a restaurant or something could require people to take their temperature before coming in? That, that might be possible. I don't have a definite answer for you on that. And I mean, on the topic of volunteers, um, this organization is very small and they do not have employees and rely on volunteers only. Are there policies that should be put in place for volunteers working events when we are able to start producing them again, i.e. all volunteers will be provided with gloves and masks or asking all volunteers with health issues to please stay home? Um, anything to protect nonprofits from a possible lawsuit or negative press. Right. So I, th I think that if you had employees would apply to volunteers in terms of trying to ensure health and safety. So you would want to make sure that if, if the county has, has orders about what's required to reopen safely, that you are following all of those protocols. And similarly, if there's any other state or federal guidance about what you should be doing, that you should follow it to try to minimize your risk. Minimize the risk of someone catching COVID and also the risk of liability because then you're not showing any negligence or any, you're trying to ensure that everyone's safe. Okay. And one last one on employees and employee handbook. An employee handbook states that an employment is at will. It seems that while employees can terminate employment at will, employers cannot. 
is there any benefit to being an at-will employer in California? Right, so I definitely recommend that employers keep this at-will employment relationship. Although it often seems like California employers are not at will, it's not an at-will re employment relationship, it really is. So for instance, um, if you're not in that will of employment, then you have to have good cause as a reason to fire someone. So you'd have to really document their performance and um, everything, you know, have all this why someone go. If you're an at will employer, you can just terminate the employment relationship without going into all that information. Um, so it would be, it's much, uh, it's advisable to have to be at will. Um, okay, I think we'll hold the other questions that we have till the end. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do we still have Juan on the line? Looks like we might be having some technical difficulties. Uh, so Arlene, maybe if you want to continue answering a few of the employment law questions while we um, figure out how to get Juan back on the line. Okay, I will keep asking. I see um, that there's a question about what, okay. Wh let's see if this one, if we understand it correctly. What do you do when you are rehiring for program staff only and not development? Do you have to offer a development staff person a new position if it's based on tenure? Development is Hello? being based out for now due to lack of special events. Hello, uh, real oh, quickly, this is Juan. Hi, Juan. My, my, inter my internet signal died. Uh, I can continue dialing in by phone if you'd like me to. I've got sure. to put it up on my slides here. Okay, tell me when you want me to start. Arlene, do you want to hold this question and let? Okay. Yeah. If we have time at the end, I'll answer that. Thanks. Okay. Juan. We'll answer this at the end. Okay. Apologies, everyone. Um, I had the most horrible thing happen that you could happen when you're trying to do a Zoom video conference, which is your internet completely dies. And so we have tried to reboot our server a couple of times and it's not working. So um, my apologies, but. Um, uh, if we can go to the slide that says PPP loan forgiveness, I can start there. Let me know when the, when the slide is up. We're there. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff to cover here, so I'm going to go pretty quickly, um, and we can follow up with any questions that might come afterwards. Uh, but let's do a quick recap. What is PPP? It's a payroll protection program that was created by the CARES Act, which was passed by Congress. Uh, in response to the uh, coronavirus pandemic, and it was signed by the president into law. The CARES Act created a number of economic stimulus programs, including the PPP. Now, the PPP was sort of tacked on to uh, the uh, Small Business Act, which is what the SBA does when it provides uh, loans to businesses. Uh, some of you may have had the opportunity to get uh, business loans from the SBA, and this is within the section of the SBA called uh, 7A. Um, so it is part of the general um, uh, applicable uh, rules that uh, govern uh, SBA loans are tacked on to the PPP program. But the PPP has several special provisions here. Uh, it is meant to cover specifically uh, payroll and uh, mortgage interest and rent that a small business of fewer than 500 employees uh, might have to suffer during the pandemic, uh, specifically in an eight week period covering from the time that the loan is offered to um, uh, eight weeks following or June 30th, 2020 at the latest. Now the uh, loan program can be converted audio. I'm just going to continue on the phone here. Um, now, the uh, PPP can be converted to a grant, meaning essentially that it's free money to you 
if you use 75% of that uh, towards payroll in the next eight weeks and the remainder should be used for rent or mortgage interest. Um, if you don't use it for any of those purposes, then it doesn't become a forgivable uh, loan or a grant, I should say. It simply becomes a loan. Uh, and the loan is at 1% with payments deferred for a year with a maximum term of two years. So in other words, this is uh, very inexpensive money compared to say a bank line of credit or other uh, lending facilities. Um, so that's the basics of the PPP program. Now the important thing that's in front of us all right now is that we are now looking at applying the PPP proceeds and we are looking at what will be the process for the loan to be forgiven, okay? And just barely last week, the uh, Small Business Administration uh, put together the uh, application for loan forgiveness as well as an FAQ. Um, you'll see in my um, uh, slides the links to both the loan forgiveness instructions and its application as well as the FAQ. There's the new FAQ um, that also addressed a particular issue of employment rehires. You know, we've all been through this situation and you've heard about it in the news. I had to shut my business and I had to lay off people. I then got a PPP loan. I'm supposed to use my PPP loan towards my employees. Uh, what happens if I offer employment to my employees and they decide not to come back and they prefer to stay on unemployment? Well, uh, previously, the rule would have been that the forgiveness of your loan would have been reduced in proportion to the amount by which you did not maintain the same payroll that you had prior to February 15 of 2020. And so what they're saying now, it's not your fault as an employer if an employee decides that they want to stay on unemployment and not be uh, given an offer of rehiring. They are, um, in that particular regard, uh, putting out a new rule that they mentioned in FAQ 40 of the PPP, uh, which says that an employer essentially will not be penalized if the employee has decided not to return to work. Um, however, it might create an issue for the employee if they want to go and remain uh, obtaining unemployment benefits because they have an offer of employment. You can't be both offered employment and essentially trying to get unemployment at the same time. And the purpose here is that, is that Congress wanted to incentivize small businesses to keep people on payroll. They didn't want to incentivize people going on to unemployment. They don't want you to have your cake and eat it too, in essence. Um, so you need to apply for your PPP loan forgiveness with the bank that gave you the PPP loan. And as you might have seen during the process of applying for the PPP, each bank had separate uh, application um, uh, processes that, that differed from bank to bank. You may also have a situation where your bank might require you to complete certain information that's greater than what is in the application that's set forth by the SBA. So check with your banker, keep in touch with your bank and get them the information they need. Uh, I also saw that there was a question previously about whether sort of you could front end your uh, payroll, if you will, so that you spend the money and then reduce your employee's salary uh, to their annualized uh, salary going forward. I wouldn't recommend that. That's not what the purpose of Congress did when they put together the PPP program. They basically wanted you to keep employment consistent. Uh, if it turns out that you do not spend all of your PPP funds, you can keep it as a loan and pay 1% or just give it back. You can just give it back and there'll be no penalty to you. So can we go to the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Uh, okay, I want to talk, I've been asked to talk a little bit about uh, real estate. Um, I'm looking at real estate issues here uh, from a um, sort of perspective as a, as a general business lawyer who handles leases and business loans for uh, acquisition of properties. And you've got essentially what's a domino effect here, right? A tenant has to close their business. So the tenant has to go to the landlord and ask for some kind of concession on rent uh, or forbearance or extension of terms. Uh, 
Well, if the landlord does that, the landlord's short on income. Uh, many of my clients are mom and pop landlords. It's not like they're big institutional shopping malls. So what do they do when it turns out that they can't make their mortgage payments? They go to the bank and they ask for forbearance on mortgage. And then what does the bank do? You know, we're essentially facing sort of this series of toppling dominoes. And I think the best way to approach it is that we're all somehow having to have to share this pain together. Uh, no one is going to get away uh, with the best situation for them, given the circumstances, because we're all going to have to do some trading. Uh, and if you're a tenant who is uh, negotiating um, modifications of your lease terms, uh, one of the things you should probably bear in mind is, you know, who is your landlord? Is your landlord uh, a, a large institutional owner of an office building? Is it a uh, family office that owns a, a strip mall? Um, I mean, you've got to take in context what it is that they're facing as well, because they may or may not be able to give you all of the concessions that you want, depending on their circumstances. What are the things that are available to you as a tenant? You know, I sort of try to list these in order of most favorable for tenants in your lease negotiations. The first would be, of course, any type of abatement of rent. Can I get away with paying 50% of my rent? Can you give me uh, April rent zero? You know, can you mark me down and give me essentially an abatement? Uh, some landlords might be willing to do that. Uh, some landlords might be willing to do that in part in exchange for other concessions from you. So it's a bit of a challenging uh, perspective to try and negotiate because each one of these situations is different. However, um, another thing that you might be able to do is to ask for a deferral of a portion of your rent due and then tack it on to the end of the rent term. You know, if you've got 24 months in your lease, uh, you might ask for a two months deferral and then pay those two months stretched out over the course of time. Uh, sometimes we're allowing landlords to use uh, reserves and security deposits that they've got cash on hand uh, to be able to offset uh, the rents today. Basically taking that cash that the landlord's got and satisfy your obligations. You've already paid it, um, let's put it to use. If you are in the shopping center or if you have a triple net lease, uh, there might be different circumstances that you can negotiate there. Uh, you can ask for a reduction of the common area maintenance charges or the CAM charges. If the shopping center is closed, the landlord is not paying expenses for security and cleanliness, so you should be able to get a, uh, a write-down of that particular rent. Um, in a triple net lease, everyone has already paid their property taxes and their insurance. We might consider not having to pay that proportion of the rent going to the property tax now. Um, some landlords are asking for you to prove your financial hardship. And I have seen landlords present tenants with forms essentially providing an affidavit that you are substantially impacted by the coronavirus pandemic and it's affecting your business and your balance sheet and your ability to pay rent. And that's perfectly reasonable. The balance sheet, you know, is going to show to the landlord what your cash flows are like during this period and sort of to justify the ability for you to pay or not pay rent and give a landlord an assessment of how much concessions you might need. So um, some people have considered that to be sort of confidential information. You know, I don't want anyone to know my, my balance sheet, my cash flow statements, but it's probably a good thing to disclose your hardship to your landlord in terms that they can understand. Um, I think one thing that I just want to emphasize is we're in a wide open playing field here. I mean, there is no, playbook right now. There is no precedent. There is no market standard for what rent concessions should be asked for or should be available. It's because this is unprecedented. So ask for what you need. Ask for what more than what you need to see if you can get it, just like in any negotiation. Um, I see a question here from Howard that says, are rent negotiations any different for commercial as opposed to residential? Um, uh, we'll get to that uh, related to um, uh, eviction issues on the next slide. So let's move to that, please. Um, other real estate issues that we've discussed uh, internally and with clients is whether force majeure applies. Um, and this is a bit of a tricky issue because 
force majeure is a set of circumstances outside of one's control that prevents them from performing a contract. So if you apply that to a lease, what does it mean? It means that circumstances outside of your control are preventing you from paying the rent on the lease. However, most leases have force majeure provisions that say the payment of rent is not exculpated in a force majeure situation. So what people have been talking about is whether or not the stay-at-home orders, whether or not you are an essential business, is essentially another uh, reason for you to be unable to occupy the premises and to use that. And they also make it unable for the landlord to be able to provide for you premises that are for a legal purpose. You can't be operating legally if you've been forced to shut down, if you're not an essential business. So um, some people have argued that that's an excuse for walking away from the leases in their totality. I wouldn't necessarily argue that. I think a lot of that might come out in litigation. There will be lawsuits about people who have tried to uh, walk away from their leases uh, under these circumstances. Um, let's just say that that might be a last resort to try and break a lease, that um, it is uh, not a lease for a legal purpose if it's been forced to shut by a governmental order. Um, the other thing worth noting is if you're going to try and walk away from a lease, uh, some leases have guarantees, and there might be other uh, entities or persons who would now be personally liable if the principal tenant tries to walk away from the lease or tries to fail to pay rent without getting into a written agreement with the landlord. Um, now, uh, at least in the city of San Diego, there is a moratorium on uh, commercial evictions through May 31st. Uh, you need to really drill down on your city your county and your state orders that are moving targets and that are changing. Uh, there are provisions that are getting extended. This moratorium uh, may well get extended beyond May 31st, at least for the city of San Diego. It would be uh, related to non-payment of rent after March 12th. So if you're the tenant and after March 12th, you couldn't pay rent, you didn't pay rent, the commercial landlord cannot move to evict you. Um, to, do, uh, to be eligible for that, you would need to provide written notice to your landlord that you can't pay rent because of the pandemic. Uh, you need to provide documentation to the landlord to that effect. And the landlord would not be able to uh, institute any collection action or to charge or collect any late fees, penalties, or interest related to the non-payment of rent. And at least with respect to the city of San Diego, uh, uh, council's ordinance, you would then have an additional six months after the um, moratorium has expired to pay the rent that you didn't pay in March, April, or in May. Uh, but once again, these moratoriums are subject to being extended. There is also a uh, California Judicial Council order uh, that suspends court activities for evictions um, and for um, uh, foreclosures on commercial rents. Um, anyway, again, check with your council and stay up to date. Review the ordinances and the orders as they get applied and as they get extended in the uh, jurisdictions that apply to you. So uh, let's move to the next slide, please. Okay, let's let's just have some general conversation about how nonprofits are organized how they're operated from a uh, corporate law perspective before you consider what you want to do in terms of, say, insolvency or reorganization or merger. First of all is how is your organization governed? Is it governed by a board of directors? Is it um, a member or a non-member organization? Very quickly, nonprofits can be member or non-member organizations. If it is a member organization, then a major decision related to a structural reorganization has to be approved by the members according to the articles and bylaws of the nonprofit. However, if it's a non-member organization, then it is the board of directors that takes the decisions. And so you need to operate in the ordinary course there. One thing worth noting is that 
you know, taking a a major decision like a reorganization, like dissolution, uh, is is obviously transcendental to the operations of the organization. The board will be prote- will be protected if it exercises prudent business judgment according to corporate law. Uh, what that means is essentially the board should have considered all the alternatives. It doesn't mean the board has to make the best decision. It just has to make the decision that it makes in good faith based on the information available to it at the time. So if you're an executive director and you need to go to the board, you need to give them as much information as you can for them to be able to make a good decision, to exercise prudent business judgment. The other thing to take into account is if you're going to go some kind of uh, reorganization is that uh, you have an IRS tax exemption. If you're a 501c3, you are a charitable uh, organization that is exempt uh, uh, exempt from taxes consistent with operating with your approved charitable function. Uh, If you, say, are um, a... Uh, scholarship organization and you want to pivot and start becoming a nonprofit that provides research for skin cancer, that's not within your nonprofit function. In other words, if you're going to pivot, if you're going to change activities, you need to stay within the tax exempt purpose that's been granted you by the IRS. What is that tax exempt purpose? You want to go back to your form 1023, which was the application for tax exemption that the IRS gave you. Uh, Let's move to the next slide, please. Make sure that you're keeping in in mind your board issues and your tax exemption when you want to consider any of these major business decisions. And I've talked to a couple of nonprofits through the uh, San Diego Volunteer Lawyers Program uh, pro bono project that we've got going now, and they're talking about uh, downsizing activities. They're talking about um, cutting programs. Once again, make sure that you're doing so within the context of your tax exemption. So what's available to you? You know, if you're going to be thinking that I can't raise funds anymore, what do we do with this organization? We've basically got, you know, two significant alternatives, which is dissolution or merger. Um, So I'm going to leave it very simple in the sense that if you dissolve, as a nonprofit, what you need to do is make sure that all of the assets of your organization are going to be given to another nonprofit organization that is substantively in the same area that you are, okay? Um, And the other thing is if you merge with another nonprofit, all of the assets and liabilities of both nonprofits are going to go into the merged entity. So essentially you wanna be able to merge into an entity that's probably got a more robust balance sheet than you. If you've got cash flow problems because of the crisis, you wanna be merging into an entity that's better off financially than you are because you go to as two, one plus one is not gonna equal two in that circumstance. So um, the last alternative is insolvency. Uh, which is try to come out of reorganization, dismiss your creditors, dismiss your lease, I suggest you consider that with your bankruptcy counsel. Uh, And I'm close up to the time limit, so we want to get to questions, and um, uh, I'll leave it at that for now. Great. Thank you so much. We have about eight questions, um, and I am just going to take them in order, and that means we'll probably bounce back and forth between Arlene and Juan. Is it, all, is it correct that loan forgiveness will not be reduced if an employee voluntarily resi- resigned during the loan period? Juan, you're muted. We can't hear you now. The, the CARES Act itself, the PPP program, uh, was wanting for you to be able to rehire employees. Um, If the employee resigns during the interim period and you don't get a replacement employee, then your forgiveness will be reduced. So remember, you need to see, you need to spend at least 75% of your PPP on payroll to get forgiveness. If you spend less than that, then you're going to be jeopardizing a portion of that forgiveness. And if that is because the employee resigns and you do not find a replacement, 
I think you will get penalized. I think your loan forgiveness will be reduced. What should we know about the potential extension of the covered period for PPP to 16 weeks? Uh, what should we know about that is to keep checking with the news, keep checking uh, with your bank. It is being discussed in Congress right now to be extended beyond the original eight week period, but it's all in discussions right now. Either uh, Congress will pass a law to extend it or the Small Business Administration will pass a rule to extend it. And that uh, link to the uh, FAQs for PPP is constantly being updated by the SBA when um, they uh, put up new information. So just keep checking that link and um, we'll see. We're all sort of waiting on bated breath right now. Okay. Since the PPP requires a certain head count on employees be maintained, are there ways around that for industries that are not essential who cannot legally work anyway? Um, I don't know if there's a, a way around it. Um, if employees have resigned or were laid off and don't want to come back after they've been offered employment, uh, you should be finding replacement employees, essentially. Uh, you should be trying to maintain that headcount and maintain the same base monthly wages that you were paying at the time that you applied for PPP. To the extent that you don't maintain that, your PPP will not be forgiven for that portion that is not consistent with what was applied for. And so what that means is that PPP portion that's not forgiven now becomes a loan that's gonna accrue 1% interest or to avoid that loan being accrued at 1% interest, pay it back immediately. Okay, and our last question on payroll is, I've heard that payroll funded by federal grants, HUD specifically, is not eligible for forgiveness under PPP. Are you familiar with that rule? Uh, I'm not familiar with that rule. You should go to the FAQs and see if it's a question that's covered there. Um, I'm probably uh, certain that it's something that's, that's been discussed in the FAQs. Okay, we have three other questions. They're all related to land and lease negotiations. Are rent negotiations any different for commercial as opposed to residential? There are currently no evictions for residential tenants. Well, I think I tried to cover some of that uh, in the presentation. Uh, for example, uh, we touched on the City of uh, San Diego uh, Council's ordinance uh, related to uh, commercial um, uh, evictions um, and um, that moratorium uh, for non-payment of rent through May 31st. I mean, I think the issue here is that every situation is unique. Every tenant is unique. Every landlord is unique. And I don't know that there's a hard and fast rule. I think as a matter of practice, what I'm seeing the most is deferment of rent or in the case of the mortgages, a deferment of mortgage payments for say the period of March, April, and May, and then those rent payments being tacked onto uh, the lease agreement uh, at the end of its term or somehow amortized and spread out over the balance of the term. Can you touch on whether section two of SB 939 only applies to cafes, restaurants, et cetera, or does it also apply to nonprofits? I'm sorry, I can't touch on that. I don't know what SB 939 is without being able to research it. Uh, we just don't have time right now. All Apologies. right, and then back to the PPP. Uh, the initial PPP application simply asked for the number of employees. The loan forgiveness application is asking for full-time employees. Is that accurate? Well, the PPP application was asking you for not only the number of employees you had, whether they are full-time or part-time, but also asking you for your average monthly wages. The loan application, I'm sorry, the loan forgiveness application uh, is probably going to be asking you for the same thing. But remember, the loan forgiveness application that is uh, on file right now on the website um, may also be changed um, by your bank. Your bank might ask you for additional information, such as 
how many employees you had, whether they were full-time or part-time, and how you spent that money across the balance of your full-time or part-time employees. I think it's a little bit premature to fully understand what the loan forgiveness application is going to end up as. As you'll recall, the PPP application came out in various forms and it changed about three times during the process. This is a very fluid situation. So what we just got in terms of the loan forgiveness application on May 16th is likely to change over the course of the next couple of weeks. And if we get to the point where the forgiveness period extends from eight weeks to 16 weeks or however long, we might see more iterations of this coming along. So I'd say in that regard, check with your bank because your bank is going to have to receive the loan forgiveness application. They're going to have to sort of uh, analyze and assess whether you comply with the terms of loan forgiveness before the loan will be forgiven. Okay, and I'm, I think this question's for Arlene and I don't know if we answered it, it was in the chat. Um, what constitutes a business justification for a layoff? We used our PPP to keep our staff, but must lay off a senior staff member when the money runs out at the end of June because of loss of revenue due to COVID-19. Right, so a business justification, running out of money would be a business justification. So, so that would be a sufficient reason if you can't pay the employee. So something that wouldn't be a business justification would be on, related to something else like their, um, their age or their disability status or something like that. Okay, great. Well, I think we've answered everyone's questions. This was fast and furious and a lot of information. I want to remind everybody who is still on the webinar with us that um, there is a, clin a legal clinic that these folks um, make available to you and you, you will receive um, the information that's been in chat and also on the slides um, on our website shortly. And there is information about the clinic um, on those slides. Roya, did you have anything else that you wanted to say about that? Uh, just that, you know, uh, thank you again to Fieldstone and the Nonprofit Institute, and of course to Juan and Arlene. Um, and yes, if anyone uh, who's listening to this has further questions about their nonprofit, please feel free to apply to our uh, COVID-19 brief legal advice clinic, um, where you can be paired directly to work with, you know, amazing attorneys such as Juan and Arlene to, you know, talk through your, your specific issues. So. Um, the link will be in the slides that will be sent out. All right, and I, on behalf of the Nonprofit Institute and all of us at Fieldstone, I wanna thank you. This was really wonderful, important information. I appreciate the time and you sharing your expertise with us and our nonprofit community. For those of you who are still with us, I wanna remind you we have another webinar coming up on Friday. It's with Trevor Blair of Blair Search Partners. And as we've spent a lot of time today talking about layoffs and people not being able to maintain their jobs because of lack of revenue. This is a webinar that's focused on resume building and uh, writing LinkedIn profiles. So please pass that along and everyone is welcome in the nonprofit sector that may be looking for a job or feels that their credentials are not where they need to be for um, what's on its way to us in terms of unemployment in our sector. So that is on Friday at 12 noon and the information again is on both the Fieldstone and Nonprofit Institute websites. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you to Arlene, to Juan, and to Roya, and hope you have a, a wonderful rest of your day.